Good morning, students. Uh, this is Amandeep Singh Bui. Uh, I'm associate professor in Department of Mechanical Engineering in ATC Amritsar. Today, uh, we are going to start a second chapter, second unit that is known as the power unit uh, in automobile engineering course. Okay, uh, power unit, uh, as uh, we all know, it is uh, the that part of the automobile that produces the power uh, required for the automobile to move or to run, uh, say in forward or reverse direction. Plus this power unit also uh, provides power to run uh, the auxiliary uh, devices also, like your uh, power windows, uh, your air conditioners, okay, the blowers. Uh, so all these uh, thing lights, uh, also all these uh, things, auxiliary things that are attached to the automobile, uh, these are also run uh, with the help of this power unit. Now, if, you, uh, if we look at uh, the basic structure of uh, any engine, IC engine uh, that is there in your automobiles. So uh, from this diagram, you can see the various parts of an IC engine. Starting from the top, uh, we have a spark plug or a, you will have a, a nozzle here uh, or a fuel injector is there. Spark plug is uh, uh, attached uh, in your petrol engines and in diesel engines, we have usually the, uh, the fuel injectors there. Okay. So uh, on the top housing, we have the camshaft is there and this camshaft has cams on it. And these cams, they uh, help uh, move uh, the valves. Uh, they help uh, open and close the valves. There are two types of valves here. You have the inlet valve and you have the outlet valve or the exhaust valve. Inlet valve is attached to the inlet uh, manifold of uh, the IC engine and exhaust valve is attached to the exhaust manifold of the engine. Okay. Uh, the air fuel mixture comes in from the this intake uh, manifold. Okay, so when uh, this cam uh, opens this valve, uh, so the intake uh, takes place and the air fuel mixture goes into the combustion chamber. Okay, and at that instant, uh, the exhaust valve is closed. Okay, so after uh, the intake mixture goes inside the piston cylinder, uh, that is uh, the first stroke is your intake stroke. After that, when the piston starts to move from the bottom dead center towards the top dead center, both the valves are closed and the compression of the air fuel mixture takes place. And just before uh, the uh, compression process or just before the piston uh, is about to reach the top dead center during the compression stroke, the spark is ignited or uh, the fuel is injected in uh, the case of petrol and diesel engines respectively. And then the combustion takes place and the power, that is the power stroke is there. So we produce power. In that case, uh, this high pressure that is produced because of the combustion pushes the piston downwards from the top dead center to the bottom dead center and the power stroke is uh, completed. And after that, the last stroke is the exhaust stroke. Now all the flue gases that are produced because of uh, the result of combustion all those flue gases are then the exhaust valve opens and the flue gases are pushed outwards with the uh, motion of the piston going from bottom dead center towards the top dead center. So that completes uh, your one cycle. So in this one cycle, uh, we have four strokes uh, going on. <clears throat> that is your suction, compression, power, and uh, the last one is your exhaust. So that is why, because four strokes are going on, so such engines are known as four stroke engines, okay. because the piston is sweeping four uh, stroke lengths. Okay. So uh, in this uh, four strokes, there are uh, three idle strokes, that is your, uh, your uh, suction, compression, and your exhaust stroke. Now these three strokes are your idle strokes. And there is one working stroke, that is the power stroke. So there are three idle strokes and one is your working stroke or the power stroke is there. So that is the basic working of a four stroke engine. 
Okay. Uh, then other parts of uh, this engine, uh, uh, apart from the valves, is your the combustion chamber. The cylinder is there. Inside the cylinder, there is a piston. On the piston, there are uh, piston rings that are attached. Uh, and uh, inside the piston, uh, the piston is connected to the crankshaft with the help of a connecting rod. Now the connecting rod, you can see there are uh, two ends of the connecting rod. There is the small end of the connecting rod and there is the bigger end of the connecting rod. The small end of the connecting rod is attached with the help of uh, the gudgeon pin or the wrist pin uh, to the piston side. And the big end of uh, the connecting rod is connected to the crank of the crankshaft with the help of crank pin. Okay. And uh, the connecting rod is connected to the crankshaft. And on the crankshaft, there is this uh, crank is there, this uh, uh, counterbalance, the part at the bottom, this, this is known as the crank, it is the cr uh, counterbalance. And, so, and this, uh, this white circle, this is the crankshaft. So we get uh, this uh, uh, lateral motion or the uh, up and down motion or the translational motion of the piston gets converted into the rotary motion with the help of the connecting rod. And that rotary motion is uh, uh, produced on the crankshaft. And from the crankshaft, we can take this uh, rotary motion as output and we get the mechanical work as the output is there. So other terminology that is uh, associated with the IC engine is your top dead center. Top dead center is the topmost position up till which the piston can go upwards. Okay. Then is your bottom dead center. It is the bottom most position uh, inside the cylinder for a piston. And the distance between the top dead center and the bottom dead center is known as the stroke length. Okay. Stroke length is usually denoted by capital L. Then bore, bore is the internal diameter of the combustion chamber or the cylinder. Okay. It is noted by D. Okay. Clearance volume uh, is your volume that is there uh, uh, between the top dead center and the cylinder head. Cylinder head and the top dead center, that volume is known as the clearance volume. So now the volume between the top dead center and the bottom dead center is known as the swept volume. Okay. So this is uh, the basic terminology uh, that is associated with your IC engine. Uh, okay, this uh, this is uh, again uh, the you have uh, the combination of the piston and the connecting rod here. Now this uh, at the bottom, this is the big end of the connecting rod, and the small end of the connecting rod is attached to the piston inside here. Okay. Now on the piston, the top uh, is known as the piston crown. Crown is there. Okay. And then you have uh, the piston rings here. You have three uh, piston rings are there. The top uh, most piston ring is known as the compression ring, top compression ring. Then is your uh, second compression ring is there. And the third is your oil ring is placed. Okay. So the piston uh, has uh, other part below this uh, oil ring. This part of the piston is known as the piston skirt. Okay. And then you have uh, the connecting rod. This is the shaft of the connecting rod. Okay, so this is uh, the connecting rod cap is there. So this uh, at the big end of the connecting rod, this can be uh, divided into or this can be dismantled by opening these bolts. Okay, and then uh, this is placed on top of the uh, crankshaft, and then the other end is attached from the other side, and then the bolts are tightened. And uh, this is how the connection to the connecting rod side is done okay so this is uh, the piston and connecting rod so next uh, if you see here this is uh, the cut section of uh, uh, a four stroke uh, engine it, it's a four stroke four cylinder engine so four cylinder because there are four pistons in here. So if there are four pistons means there are four cylinder. It's a four cylinder engine. If you see the various parts of this engine and the bottom, this is the oil pan is there. 
for the reservoir for the um, engine oil okay uh, then uh, with the this is your this you can see the, this yellow stick that is protruding this is your dipstick uh, using this you can uh, you can take it out from this ring and you can check the level of uh, the engine oil that is present in there so there is a marking for uh, the low level and maximum level so you can check the engine uh, quality and the engine quantity also both you can check okay from this engine pan then you have this oil uh, filter here where the uh, air oil gets filtered then you have a pump that pumps this oil to various parts of the engine uh, you have uh, on this side this purple this is your alternator alternator is the one that converts the mechanical energy to electrical energy and uh, this alternator then it recharges your battery also that is available in the uh, okay the car uh, then inside you can see the various parts uh, the bottom here this shaft is your connecting uh, shaft is sorry your crank shaft is there on crank shaft there are cranks and on the crank pin uh, the connecting rods of the various pistons they are attached uh, and this connecting rod is again attached to the piston Okay, the piston moves inside this cylinder here. On top, you can see the valves, inlet exhaust valves are there. Then is your spark plug or fuel injector is uh, housed here. Okay, and on top uh, of this, you can see this uh, yellow shaft uh, with the cams on it. This is the cam shaft. So cam shaft uh, is driven with the help of this uh, timing belt uh, that is attached to the crank shaft. Is there? So crank shaft uh, it moves your uh, camshaft also plus your uh, this fan this is the cooling fan uh, for radiator okay so this is this is the uh, layout of the engine so this pipe here this pipe is your exhaust pipe from where the exhaust gases go out uh, from the engine so these are uh, your various parts of a of an engine this is the cut section uh, we will discuss uh, each and every part of an engine in detail uh, okay now next uh, if we go on to see a power unit now the major components of a power unit can be your first is your cylinder block is there then cylinder head is there uh, then crank case is there oil sump or oil pan is there cylinder liners are there piston is there piston rings are there connecting rod crankshaft flywheel camshaft spark plug or fuel injector is there valves and valve mechanism so all these 14 are the major components of any ic engine or an automobile engine okay. so in the diagram also you can see the various parts that are there uh, so you have uh, the wall springs distributor is there uh, now this distributor uh, is used to distribute the spark in the case of a petrol engine uh, so petrol engine has spark plugs so it needs uh, a spark or an electrical uh, spark uh, that comes from the battery and through the alternator uh, through the and it goes to the spark and produces the required spark for combustion. Okay. So we will discuss the, all these parts one by one in detail. Uh, the first thing is that comes is your cylinder block. Now this uh, at the diagram at the bottom, you can see this is the diagram of a cylinder block. So there are two uh, views here. This is the top view and this is from the side bottom views there. Isometric views are there. Now it consists of three parts. This cylinder block it consists of three parts. Uh, the cylinder in which the piston slides up and down. Now this uh, you can see the circular holes on top are there. These circular holes are made. These are cylinders actually. These are hollow inside. So these are the cylinders. In these cylinders, the piston moves up and down. Okay. This is first part. Second is the passage for the flow of cooling water. So all these grooves, you can see, uh, we have seen that in the video also uh, yesterday in the practical. Now these uh, grooves are made throughout uh, this uh, engine block. These, these grooves are provided during casting only. So in these grooves, what happens is the coolant that is mixed with water, it circulates. 
and that coolant absorbs the heat from the engine okay and it keeps the uh, engine under the required temperature conditions wo thanda rakhta hai engine ko that is the uh, gurus are there and then the bottom of the block supports the crank shaft oil sump and the cam shaft now at the bottom of this uh, you can see this is the bottom flange now at the bottom flange this is uh, the oil sump or the oil tank is connected at the bottom inside the oil tank the crank shaft uh, is uh, there okay now this is this is if you see on the diagram on the right hand side this is your crank shaft on which the cranks are there and on the crank pins uh, the the connecting rods are connected and the connecting rods are connected to the uh, pistons and those pistons they move inside the cylinder okay. so this is this is uh, again this it supports the bottom housing okay in which uh, the oil sump crank shaft and the cam shafts are placed okay now if you see the various uh, parts of uh, this engine so you will have oil galleries also so these oil galleries uh, are uh, provided for uh, the oil to pass through them and then this oil uh, that passes through these galleries it lubricates the piston and cylinder from inside okay watch so that this oil is used to lubricate uh, the piston and cylinders okay so there are internal grooves are made inside this uh, cylinder block okay so from which uh, high pressure oil is passed and that oil reaches each and every part from inside uh, like it 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 uh, uh, lubricates your uh, crankshaft uh, this oil it lubricates the piston and cylinder linings uh, is there okay and uh, the camshaft the cylinder block is usually made up of uh, gray cast iron sometimes it is made with addition of nickel and chromium aluminum and compacted graphite cgi is called uh these engines uh, are used for heavy duty uh, engines or uh, okay heavy duty alloys they are made uh, for these uh, additional uh, elements where we use chromium uh, or nickel so these are made for say racing cars okay where we need uh, where more heat is produced and, uh, and we need uh, the structure that is more solid okay. so this is your cylinder block on top of the cylinder block on top of the cylinder block comes the cylinder head so this cylinder head sits on top of the your this cylinder block here okay. now inside this uh, cylinder head so on top of the cylinder block it is covered with a separate cast piece known as the cylinder head and it is bolted to the cylinder block it is made up of uh, gray cast iron or it is also made in with alloy aluminum alloy aluminum alloy uh, we make uh, nowadays uh, the we uh, make the engine parts with aluminum uh, alloys because aluminum is lighter and it reduces the weight of the engine now inside this uh, uh, this uh, cylinder head the various parts uh, that are there it houses the camshaft and your uh, valves and the valve uh, actuation mechanism also so the mechanism with which the valves open and close all that mechanism is housed inside the cylinder head so you can see that these are the uh, valve springs are there uh, valve retainers are there rocker arm is there uh, then is your uh, the uh, the pivot arms are there that uh, open and closes uh, that the mechanism that is used to uh, operate these rocker arms to open and close the uh, valves so all that uh, valve opening and closing mechanism is housed inside the cylinder head okay it contains the camshaft rock, uh, rockers and valves all these things are placed inside the cylinder head okay next comes is your piston rings the piston rings uh, they are expandable uh, rings that are provided uh, as a seal between the piston and the cylinder wall so piston or cylinder wall ke beech mein it makes a seal 
okay so it does not allow the uh, products uh, that are there on top of the piston to go down into the uh, say crankcase and the products from the crankcase to go into the combustion chamber so it, it they, they are the piston rings they form seals okay. now these piston rings they are made up of uh, alloys of cast iron with silicon and magnesium mixed in it okay or alloy steels coated with chromium tin or lead okay so we can either mix these materials like silicon or magnesium in the cast iron to form the alloys or we can have a alloy steel with coating of chromium tin or cadmium now these are these coatings are done because these coatings are very good heat and corrosion resistant coatings so that is why these types of coatings of tin and chromium and cadmium are done on these piston rings because piston rings they will be uh, always be in uh, uh, the environment of high temperature and under high temperature there is always uh, possibility of uh, oxidation and corrosion is there so there are three types of uh, rings piston rings are there first is your compression ring now in the compression ring it is the topmost ring uh, there are three grooves are made for uh, the uh, for housing these uh, piston rings the topmost uh, groove uh, it uh, has uh, the ring that is placed there is known as the compression ring the compression ring what it does is it seals the combustion chamber from any leakages during combustion process now during the combustion process because lot of uh, energy is being produced and uh, during that combustion the pressure inside it uh, reaches uh, very high okay uh, around uh, it, it reaches around 40 to 50 bar inside so this pressure is very high so there is always chance that the flue gases at such high temperature they might leak from the sides into the uh, crankcase at the bottom okay so this uh, piston ring it acts as a seal okay so at this such high temperature what happens is these piston rings they expand and if there is any clearance between the piston uh, rings and uh, the uh, cylinder ball so that uh, clearance is uh, covered by the expansion of this compression ring and it acts as a seal okay. so this is the function of the first compression ring second type of uh, ring it is known as the viper ring now viper ring uh, it is uh, placed in the uh, second groove or the middle groove uh, on the uh, your piston okay the viper ring they uh, what they do is they are tapered in uh, they are tapered at the face okay and what they do is they wipe off uh, the and clean the uh, wall surface the cylinder has cylinder wall surface if there is uh, there are sediments or carbon uh, particles or excess oil is there so these viper rings they wipe off and clean uh, help in cleaning the surface of the cylinder walls okay plus they also act as a sealant uh, for uh, the combustion gases so that the combustion gases does not pass uh, and go into the uh, your the crankcase at the bottom so first uh, uh, resistance is the compression ring after that the second resistance is the viper ring is there okay now third type of ring that is present is your oil ring is there now oil rings are present at the lower most groove the third groove is there uh, in the third groove the oil rings are placed okay so they are closest to the uh, crankcase the oil rings are used they are used to wipe excess oil from the cylinder walls during piston movement okay so when the piston moves up and down the oil rings what they do is they wipe off the extra oil okay from the surface okay uh, then the viper rings on top they are also wiping the uh, extra oil okay so they are bringing this oil downwards okay and the oil rings they are also wiping this extra oil from the surface so there are two uh, the viper rings they are doing two things first thing is uh, they are acting as a seal so that the compression 
combustible gases do not leak uh, down into the crankcase second is the viper rings they are also wiping the extra oil from the uh, cylinder surfaces there okay oil rings they are uh, again provided to wipe off the extra oil from the cylinder surface now the viper ring oil and the oil ring oil it collects uh, uh, in between uh, this oil rings and then from the holes at the back uh, that oil is uh, passed um, into the engine uh, oil reservoir okay into the sump oil sump is there so this is the function of the oil ring is there okay so in the diagram next diagram you can see the various uh, there are the three types of uh, rings that are present uh, first is your this compression ring now there is a clearance that is given uh, in between okay uh, this clearance is given that uh, for uh, uh, during uh, when uh, the temperature increases okay now this piston rings they expand and they expand and they cover this gap okay so at the, when they are cold they are uh, uh, there the groove is large when they becomes hot uh, this metal that expands and the groove becomes smaller okay then uh, second uh, is your uh, this is your viper ring second ring is your viper ring and the third is your uh, the bottom is one is your oil uh, ring is there okay so now here you can see that uh, this oil ring it is uh, made up of three parts so it has a top uh, sheet of a ring is there there is a bottom ring is there and in between there is this spiral ring is there okay. now this uh, the oil that comes from the viper ring and the oil that collects uh, uh, by this uh, oil ring it collects in these grooves of this spiral ring and at higher temperature what happens is this uh, ring it expands when it expands it increases the pressure of oil inside that is trapped in between and uh, there are grooves at the back okay there are holes at the back and through those holes the oil is pushed inwards inside the piston and from the inside the piston that the oil it drips down into the oil sump okay. so this is uh, the function of the oil ring is there okay. next type is your crank shaft uh, the next part component of the engine is your crank shaft now the crank shaft is the it is the first part in the power transmission uh, it has it is connected with the help of a connecting rod to the piston and when the piston moves up and down uh, the translation motion of the piston gets converted into rotational motion at the crankshaft so i will get the rotational motion at the crankshaft and one side of the crankshaft is open uh, where you can uh, use the power output uh, to run uh, other equipments okay and on the other side uh, the flange this flange is used Uh, where the flywheel is mounted okay now flywheel is mounted where the flywheel what it does is the function of the flywheel is to uh, store the power during power stroke and to provide this power during the three idle strokes that is suction compression and exhaust because in the idle strokes uh, we are not getting power from anywhere to run the piston up and down so this power uh, is uh, given with the help of this flywheel okay so this is the function of the five flywheel now it consists of crank pins webs uh, balancing weights and main journal bearing there yeah. now you can see that uh, throughout this uh, uh, crank shaft there are these holes so this is one hole is there there is another hole now each and every uh, flange on this uh, crankshaft it has these small holes are there now these holes are provided these are there are internal grooves inside this crankshaft and the oil is passed through these holes these holes are provided for lubrication process these lubricates the uh, connecting rod where the connecting rod is connected to this crank uh, plus the various bearings that are attached the main journal bearing uh, and the other bearings that are attached onto the crankshaft so these holes are provided for lubrication process now this uh, crankshaft is made up of carbon steel or nickel chromium 
and uh, other heated alloy steels. So these are the main uh, uh, materials of which this crankshaft is made up of. Next part of the engine is your uh, the camshaft. Now this camshaft contains uh, cams on top of it. So these are cams that are placed are there. Now these cams are used uh, to open and close the valves inside the cylinder. Okay, it is driven with the help of crankshaft. So the, this pulley uh, is it is the with the help of the timing belt. It is connected to the uh, pulley that is attached to the crankshaft. And with the motion of the crankshaft, uh, the camshaft also moves. Okay. Now, this uh, camshaft it converts the rotary motion into the linear motion of the follower. In this case, the follower will be your valves, inlet and exhaust valves. Now, the camshafts they are made up of chilled cast iron. They are made up of chilled cast iron. This is your camshaft. Then is your valves. Uh, the valves are provided at the inlet and exhaust manifold uh, of the engine. These are made up of authentic uh, stainless steel, which is both corrosion and heat resistant material. In racing cars, uh, the, these are made up of beryllium copper. Uh, alloy seats are there and titanium valves are used. Now these titanium valves, titanium valves, they are 40% lighter than the normal steel valves. So that is why uh, to reduce the uh, weight, we use titanium valves in racing cars. Okay. Now, if you look at the various parts of uh, this uh, valve, so we have the combustion phase is there. Okay. Then is the head of uh, this uh, valve, the stem of the valve. The head of the valve has, this is the margin. This part is the margin. This is the seat face, the stepper face is the seat face, and this uh, is your fillet. This is the stem of the valve, and this groove uh, is there. This is known as the keeper groove. Uh, in the keeper groove, this is attached uh, uh, on top, uh, where uh, it is. Uh, it can be attached to a mechanism on top. Uh, in this stem, the spring is uh, provided uh, for uh, the opening and closing of the valve. And the top part above the groove is known as the tip of the uh, valve. Okay. Now, according to the location of the valves, the, the various mechanisms of opening and closing of valves, they can be either overhead poppet valve mechanism or we have the overhead camshaft mechanism. There are two mechanisms there, overhead poppet valve mechanism and the overhead camshaft mechanism. So we will look into these mechanisms one by one. Now, this is the first uh, type of uh, mechanism is there. This is uh, your, uh, where we are using the rocker arm mechanism or the puppet valve mechanism. Now, in this case, the camshaft is not laid on top. It is on the side of the cylinder. So, here the camshaft is on the side of the cylinder. And this camshaft, it uh, is connected with the help of this tappet. This tappet is the follower. From the tappet is connected to a push rod on top. This push rod is connected to this rocker arm. Okay. So when the push rod moves up on this side, on the back side, uh, on the other side, with the help of this fulcrum, uh, the this side of the rocker arm it moves in the downward direction. When it moves in the downward direction, it pushes the valve in the downward direction, and the valve opens. Okay. Now when the cam is moved. If, uh, in the say uh, clockwise direction, the tip of the cam it moves forward. So this uh, tappet moves downwards, or this side of the rocker arm moves downwards. And with the help of this spring, uh, this uh, rocker arm is moved in the uh, upward direction, and the valve closes. So this is the mechanism of a puppet valve. Okay, in which we use uh, the tappet, push rod, and a rocker arm to open and close the. Uh, valves, inlet and exhaust valves. Now, this uh, in this case, uh, the uh, camshaft it is not placed on overhead on top of the uh, your piston cylinder, but it is on the side of the piston cylinder. Okay. And again, uh, this uh, camshaft is operated with the help of this driven uh, driven chain uh, with the help of the uh, cam crankshaft. The crankshaft operates the camshaft. 
now next comes is your the overhead where the camshaft is placed on top okay this is your overhead camshaft mechanism now in this case the camshaft is placed directly overhead uh, the piston cylinder and uh, uh, the valves are operated directly we have removed in this case uh, the in this case uh, you can see that uh, this uh, push rod tappet and rocker arm all these things are eliminated okay and uh, the piston uh, the pistons are in direct uh, contact with the connecting rod okay uh, sorry, the uh, not the connecting rod, the camshaft. Is there. Now, in this case, the camshaft, when it comes in uh, uh, downward position here, so it pushes this uh, tappet downwards, which pushes the piston, uh, your the uh, valve downwards, and the valve opens. Okay. So the spring here, it is housed inside this bucket, uh, where this is the bucket tappet. In this bucket tappet, it is hollow from inside, and the spring is housed inside this uh, bucket. So, with the movement of uh, the cams, the opening and closing of the uh, this uh, valve it takes place. Okay. So, this is uh, the other mechanism. Now, this overhead mechanism can be subdivided into two types. You have the SOHC, that is the single overhead uh, cam mechanism, and then is your double overhead cam mechanism. Okay. Now, if the number of valves are uh, the valves are uh, say small number is small so we can use single camshaft so here you have say single uh, uh, one inlet one exhaust valve on each cylinder is there so we can use single uh, camshaft single camshaft can operate uh, open and close the valves for various uh, cylinders but if you have a number of valves so here in this case in the bottom diagram you have four uh, valves on one cylinder. Now, operating four valves uh, on one cylinder, it is difficult for single overhead cam. So, in here we have uh, double overhead cam. So here you have double overhead cam. So you can see two cams are there. Now, both the cams again are uh, operated with the help of crankshaft. You get the power from the crankshaft. So this type of mechanism is known as double overhead cam mechanism. This type of arrangement is known as single overhead cam mechanism. Now, the number of valves that can be arranged on a uh, cylinder, you can have two valves per cylinder, you have exhaust valve and inlet valve. Okay. You can have three valves, you can have two inlet valves and one exhaust valve, or you can have uh, four valves, you can have two inlet valves and two exhaust valves. Depending upon that, uh, how much power uh, or how much uh, horsepower is being generated, we can have uh, these for uh, smaller cars where uh, the uh, brake horsepower is small. You can go for a two valve mechanism, like in your uh, uh, say uh, cars that come under uh, say uh, they have a smaller BHP, okay, or uh, compression ratio, uh, okay, uh, or CCs. You can say. As the uh, CC of the cars uh, that increases, the number of valves also increases. So the number of valves are uh, required. Uh, if you want more uh, power, so you want more fuel to come inside. So for more fuel to come inside, you need to increase the inlet area uh, of uh, the uh, valve. So inlet area can be increased uh, by increase, uh, increasing the number of inlet valves. So you can you can have two valves. Okay. Now, in this case, you can see that the inlet valve diameter is larger as compared to the exhaust valve diameter. Now, this is because uh, during the inlet stroke, the pressure difference uh, between uh, the air uh, outside uh, the on uh, the outside into the inlet manifold, uh, the pressure difference is less. Okay, that is outside uh, the cylinder and inside the cylinder, the pressure difference is less. Okay. So for more air to come inside, we need to increase the uh, area. Okay. So the more the area, the more air can flow inside. So because the pressure difference is less, so the other thing we can increase is the area of cross section. Okay. So that is why the area of cross section for the inlet valve is larger, so that more air can come inside during suction stroke. 
but during the uh, exhaust stroke uh, because the uh, pressure inside the cylinder is very high so smaller uh, diameter of exhaust wall because the pressure is high so air will automatically go outside because the pressure inside is high so if we can give a smaller opening the air will automatically escape from that opening so that is why the diameter of the exhaust wall is kept smaller so this is the type of number of valves per cylinder the arrangement we can have uh, now this is your uh, single uh, overhead sohc mechanism for operating different valves okay uh, so here you can have a single uh, uh, cam uh, shaft on top that can operate the valves okay so the valves are operated either directly or through rocker arms so we can have rocker arms with a single overhead mechanism also okay for operating four valves also so the valves are operated through in this case it is uh, operated through rocker arms so we have rocker arms placed and uh, with the help of those cams uh, so we can open and close the inlet and exhaust valves so this is hohc and uh, this is uh, the mechanism which is not working here i can show you this uh, mechanism now this is uh, your uh, dohc mechanism that is double overhead cam mechanism in which you have two cam shafts and uh, the two cam shafts they directly uh, operate uh, one cam shaft is there for operating the exhaust wall and the other cam shaft is available for operating the inlet wall okay. so this is your double overhead cam mechanism so uh, i can show you the uh, so here uh, we can uh, see the animation uh, for a single overhead cam mechanism here uh, so here we have uh, this cam that is uh, uh, there uh, placed on top uh, of this piston cylinder arrangement and then this is your uh, bucket uh, uh, tappet is there okay in which this uh, mechanism this piston this valve is uh, placed and then this is your uh, the spring is there uh, the valve spring is there okay. now when you can see that with the motion of uh, this cam the opening and closing of valves is taking place now the the power to rotate this cam shaft it is coming from the crank shaft so this is your sohc mechanism or single overhead cam mechanism now you can see this this is your double overhead cam mechanism so here we have two shafts or cam shafts that are placed directly overhead the inlet and exhaust valves so this is your exhaust valve smaller in diameter this is your inlet valve larger in diameter so we have four cam shafts available so this is your direct overhead cam mechanism now this is the uh, animation where you can compare the uh, different types of uh, mechanisms the first diagram on the left hand side uh, it shows you the push rod mechanism so here the cam uh, is placed on to the side of the piston cylinder uh, where the cam moves and it pushes this push rod upwards uh, which uh, moves this rocker arm which is hinged at the center and this opens and closes the valve so when it is pushed upwards it opens and with the help of spring stiffness this uh, valve it comes back to its original position that is closing position in this uh, second diagram we have here it is your sohc mechanism single overhead cam mechanism uh, which is being operated with the help of uh, there is a single cam shaft on top and with the help of this rocker arm uh, the opening and closing of the valves is taking place okay. so this is your single overhead mechanism on the right hand side you have double overhead cam mechanism where you have two cam shafts placed on top okay so we have separate cam shafts for opening and closing of the valves so this is the basic difference between the three types of mechanisms that are used for opening and closing of the valves in a four stroke engine okay next uh, topic that is uh, is your what is traction 
and attractive force. Okay. Now, the force uh, that is available at the contact between the wheel tires, that is your drive wheel tires. Okay. So, in the case of uh, say uh, front uh, wheel uh, drive, so the drive wheels will be your front wheels. In your in the case of rear wheel drive, the drive wheels will be your rear wheels. Okay. Now, in the case of four wheel drive, so the drive wheels are all four wheels. So, depending upon the drive, you can have the drive wheels. So, the force available at the contact between the drive wheel tires and the road that is known as the tractive force or the tractive effort or the it is also known as the traction force. So, jitna force uh, that is available at the tires at the intersection or at the contact point of the tire and the road. Okay? So, that force is known as the traction force or the tractive force. Now, the ability of this the drive wheels to transmit this effort without slipping. Now, this uh, force or the energy, it is coming from the engine. So, from the engine, uh, the torque or the power is going to the transmission. From the transmission, uh, it is going uh, into the differential. And from the differential, it, this power is going to the wheel. And from the this uh, wheel uh, shaft, uh, this power is transmitted to the uh, wheels or the tires. Okay. Now, this uh, power that is available at the drive wheels, how much of this, uh, if uh, all of this force is converted into the forward push okay, to drive the wheels in the forward direction without slipping, this is known as the traction. So, the ability of the drive wheels to transmit this effort, Ponzi effort, the tractive effort without slipping is known as the traction. Hence, the usable tractive effort never exceeds traction. Now, more the load on the automobile, more the tractive force required. So, tractive forces, it is the energy required to move the automobile uh, from the stationary position. So, that is your tractive effort. Okay. Now, how much of this tractive effort gets converted into by the drive wheels into motion is known as traction. Now, we know the formula for the engine torque uh, that comes from the power the engine power uh, in terms of kilowatt is given by the formula 2 pi n T e divided by 60,000. T e is the engine torque. Okay, the torque that is the, now this, this is the power that is available at the crankshaft of the engine. This power is available at the crankshaft of the engine, where T e is the engine torque, the torque that is being produced by the engine. Now, from this formula, you can, tell, uh, you can uh, take out the value of T e. Te will be equal to 60,000 divided by 2 pi n Te. So, this will be in Newton meter, where n, n is your RPM, that is revolutions per minute of the crankshaft. Now, the tractive force, now the wheel torque can be calculated as a function of engine torque. So, from the engine torque, from this formula, I can calculate the engine torque. So, if I know uh, the power developed by the engine okay from the power engine power uh, that is uh, from the specification of the engine uh, i will know that how much power or kilowatt this engine can produce okay so i can calculate from n number of revolutions that are being produced by that crankshaft okay that can be calculated uh, with the help of uh, say tachometer or stroboscope i can use to measure this RPM n, using this in the formula, I can calculate the value of engine torque. Now, this engine torque can be correlated with the uh, torque that is available at the wheels. Okay. So, how much energy that is required to move a vehicle from the stationary position and for moving that vehicle 
depending upon what is the load that that in a vehicle is going to carry okay. so i can if i can formulate a formula for that engine torque uh, that is required at the wheels and the torque that is available at the crankshaft of the engine so i can design that what type uh, what power engine is required to run that vehicle okay. so wheel torque can be calculated as a function of engine torque if the parameters and status of the transmission are known here we are going we will be uh, calculating the wheel torque and force for the engine so the various parameters that are required are the engine torque the various gear ratios now gear ratios will be uh, in the transmission uh, section or uh, in your gearbox plus the gear ratio will be there where the differential is uh, attached so we can get the gear ratios from there then the final drive ratio from the differential and the wheel radius what radius wheels we are using okay now in this uh, derivation we will be assuming that there is no slip in the clutch or the torque converter and the engine uh, is being mechanically linked to the wheels now this method can be applied to any powertrain uh, architecture front wheel drive or the rear wheel drive but for uh, easier understanding in this uh, derivation we will be considering the rear wheel drive because in this the terminology and uh, all the uh, parts or all the torques it will be more clear now here you can see this is the front of the engine where the green arrow is there so from the front of the engine this engine red is your engine is placed the engine is connected to the power or the torque that is available at the engine is given by te ix is the gear ratio of the transmission or the gearbox that is what gear one gear one two three or four we are using the gear ratio can be there after that the torque that is available uh, after the uh, your gearbox is known as the dg uh, propeller shaft is used to transmit this torque from the transmission or the gearbox to the differential at the back the differential uh, will have the gears inside those gears will have some gear ratio it is noted by i not and td is the torque that is available at the differential from this differential uh, the torque is uh, divided or it is sent to the wheels so twr is the torque available on the right wheel and tw is the l is the torque available on the left wheel from the uh, dimensions of the wheel we can have the radius of the wheel that is rw and the forward force that is required to move this wheel from the stationary position this is given by fwl there this is the forward uh, force on the left wheel and similarly we will have the fwr the forward force on the right wheel there so this is your isometric view and this is the top view there so and from the engine clutch the power uh, that is uh, available is te from here uh, the uh, power is transmitted with the help of gears uh, to the uh, gearbox so ix is the uh, gear ratio of the gearbox tg is the torque available after the gearbox or the transmission system then with the help of propeller shaft uh, this torque is uh, sent to the uh, your uh, differential uh, the differential is again connected uh, with the help of gears and the i not is the gear ratio for the differential gears td is the torque that is available uh, after uh, the differential this td gets subdivided into twr and twl equally okay so half of this td power is given to the right wheel half of the power is given to the left wheel so the force that is available to move the uh, this wheel in the forward direction or the tractive force uh, is given by fwl for the left wheel and fwr for the right wheel where rw is the radius of the wheel 